We're going to take a quick break, but there's more Chasing the Goal podcast on the way. All right, class, it's the NCAA Men's Lacrosse Championships. Welcome to Fandom 101. Want to hype up your squad from face-off to the final whistle? Here's your assignment. Lesson one, get loud for every goal. Two, work together. And three, attendance is encouraged, but passion is mandatory. The Men's Lacrosse Championships, May 27th and 29th at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. Buy your tickets today at NCAA.com slash MLacrosse. Class dismissed. Welcome to New England Lacrosse Journal's Chasing the Gold podcast, your destination for all things lacrosse. I'm your host, Kyle Devitt. Alongside me, we have, as begrudgingly usual, Jack Piatelli. Jack, how we doing? Doing real good. Real good today. Uh, <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like that tone at all. I don't, I don't like that at all. Well, I, I got a trivia question for you today. Oh, my God. Right? Okay. I got a trivia. So we, um, we're going to talk about some players, high school players. Yep. And uh, do you know who the first New England-born USA lacrosse player is? Born in New England. I'll say, I'll give you a hint. Born in Massachusetts. He went to UNH, played on the 1982 world team. That's not, that's not Mike Murphy, is it? Nope. No. John Fay? Yes! Hey! Hey! Yeah, you got him! Got okay. him. Yeah! yeah. What a pull by me! How do you like that? John Fay. You thought I was never going to get that. Two I, guesses. Do you know what high school he played at? No idea. Conquer Kyle. Oh. And he played at UNH. Great yeah. player. Yeah, broke the ice for Massachusetts. Yeah, excellent. I actually know um, when I coached at Emerson, uh, Mike Blanchard used to talk about him all the time. And the thing that he would try to teach the kids to do is how to carry his stick. Because John Fay had legendary stick protection. And he would tell, he told Mike to tell the kids that it was carrying the stick lightly. Helped him get all the control that he needed. So not to to grip so tightly when right. you're when you're cradling, when you're going through your motions to kind of just have it be like lithe and balanced every time you're trying to do something. So um, I don't know if that's that worked, but he tried that's one of the things that we got from John Fay. Yeah, tremendous athlete, competitor, great stick skills. Uh, had the opportunity to play with John with the Boston Blazers for two years. And my job was with the Blazers was I warmed him up before every game. And I would bring a a banana to the warm up because he always would eat a banana before for each game. So if he played well, I warmed him up well. <laughs> that okay. was my job. All right, <laughs> take that credit. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like kind of like Wade Boggs and chicken, but with a banana, right? Exactly. Yeah, and he listens to our show too. So shout out to John Fay. Oh, hey, John Fay, thanks for listening. Uh, also, I want to thank our guest who's here, uh, Zverin head coach uh, Dagan Morris. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Hey, Have in to be studio, in person. Yeah, in studio. Yeah, big we, moves. We try to get uh, as many people in studio as we can. Um, we are doing uh, a feature on Zavarian, so you're getting a, a full face full of Zavarian the next couple of weeks. But um, super glad to you uh, you could come in and, and join us here. And um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your program, your history uh, as a coach, and uh, you know, kind of where you, you you cut your teeth. Which uh, I don't know if you want to get into that right away. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you'll have to deal with the news blitz, but uh, they're actually happy with me. Height of admissions, you know, acceptance season. Timing's pretty good on this one, so nice. I might survive one more year. Nice. It'll it, it'll go out there, and, and everyone will be happy. Uh, you also uh, do work with with Massachusetts as well. Yep, that's right. Massachusetts uh, and our parent company, the NLF, um, which is you know a whole new barrel of laughs that's been the last couple of years, but it's been going really well. Well, that's been great for guys from the area. Um, just results speak for themselves. You know, tops in guys going Division One, tops going guys in SCAC. So it's worked out. You know, the, the plan has been good. It's been nice to see it kind of take off. What age group do you coach with them? Uh, so with Lex Hughes, we hand our guys up. So Sean Morris and I do the guys who are going into their recruiting window, so that the rising juniors, um, which is a lot of fun. That's the pressure year, but – that's when, you know, the guys are pretty locked in trying to, you know, really make sure they put the right foot forward and you get to, you know, see the right guys on the sidelines. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I will say the NLF tournament has been uh, very well run the last couple of years. And not only the competition, whether you're in double A or single A, the teams are very good and a lot of college coaches in attendance. And it's really a, 
like you said, it's a, it's a great event, not only for the Lax Joseph's kids, but a number of the other programs from New England that go and play in the NLF. It's, uh, it's, it's very well run, and we get a lot of very positive feedback from, from the results. It's one of those ones where you, you look at your tourney machine the morning of, and you're like, why do I even bother? Everyone's good. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no cupcake game. You know? That's right. Whatever three names you see, they're going to be dogfights. Yeah, it's great. But it's good. Yeah, the, I mean, even moving that tournament to, to Lehigh has been uh, interesting. And uh, not for me, because I can't go. <laughs> but uh, it's a little too far away. But, um, you know, I, I remember seeing it when it was at, at UMass uh, many years, uh, even when I was – when I was coaching, I got asked to coach a random team there one year because uh, they were out of coaches. So <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a wild experience. But, um, yeah, definitely top-tier talent playing in that every single year. Uh, the Rising Juniors Showcase, I thought, was really good, too, uh, yeah. a couple years ago and, and this past year. Let's talk a little bit about your, your <laughs> origins uh, getting into coaching, right? So you played, we found out, you, pl you played at CM pre-show. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, I went to high school at CM, which, you know, we, we don't talk about too often around the program very much. but um, Rivals in the, the Catholic League. Yeah, yeah, you know, but lots of lots of good-natured rivalry in that conference for anyone who's played in it knows. Uh, yep, so played there. Um, ended up going to Hartwick College afterwards. Uh, played for Bill Bajornis out there. Wanted to have a chance to play a lot and have a good time. Mission successful. Um, played one year in grad school across the pond uh, for the University of Leicester and came home and had the itch and didn't want to give it up quite yet, you know. And through sheer dumb luck, Medfield had two openings for assistance, and somehow in that meeting, I guess I fooled John Isaac into I could do this a little bit. Um, and that was 2013, and we were off and running, did eight years there, and, you know, probably the best experience coaching-wise, learning how to win. Yeah, and we've uh, we've had Coach Ice on the pod, uh, very very intense in a way that like is is very subtle in person, um, not so subtle outside of person <laughs> as we discussed a little bit before. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cop to this now. I don't I because I don't care. People make mistakes. I uh, <laughs> actually I actually posted uh, on Lax Journal the incorrect times for the uh, Massachusetts State Championships. And within, I, I'd already realized it within the second that I did it. And I was like, oh, I'm in the post fixing it. And who texts me? It's been up for five minutes. I five minutes, it's already getting fixed. Coach Ice, what are you doing? <laughs> you gotta fix it, it's wrong. And I was like, I'm, I'm, it's fixed already. I'm in the post. And you know, no response. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, now, now Coach Ice doesn't like me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think that kind of intensity, right? Like. I know you and uh, JD, who works at, at Maverick now, uh, you guys both worked under him. And when he told us that it was you two that were his assistants, I went, because I kind of know both of you a little bit. I went, wait, how did that work? Yeah, if his, if his hair wasn't gray already, it would have been after the first year with us together, I'm sure. A hundred percent. And I think that, you know, I say that, you know, not, not in a pejorative way. I, I feel like uh, you have an, a certain energy and a certain candor that a lot of coaches don't have. And uh, I find it refreshing. I like talking to you about anything because, you know, as long as I don't say it's, it's Dackett, I can kind of say I talked to a coach and he said this, which is great. No, that's good. That's good. That's trust, right? That's trust. Appreciate that. I'm not saying that's him every time uh, I say something, but sometimes it is. And you're you're very, you know, honest with everything. Are you, you my burner account? Uh, no, I'm not a burner account. I don't have one. I wish I did. I wish I, we talked about this, that if I made one, people would know who it was <laughs> immediately yeah, just because I, just because I would, uh, I would say things. Uh, actually people ask me if I'm, I'm behind burner accounts all the time. It's so weird. I'm like, no, I don't have to do that. I have mine. I'm like a walking burner account with just too many followers. That's how who, it works. Who has time? No, no. Well, not anymore. And I know you don't have time anymore. I have um, no time. You've recently kind of, uh, uh, switched jobs while you've been the, the head coach of Zavarian. Can you kind of talk about how that has gone through and the process of that and, you know, try, I mean, one of the things you coach in the Catholic league and the Catholic league is, I mean, it's different than a lot of other division one schools in Massachusetts, right? I mean, That's true. you're bringing kids in, you have an admissions thing. It's basically a, a, a prep school, you know? So, you know, we don't say that. I know we don't say that, but it is, there's, a, there's an admission standard that a kid has to admit before they get in. So it's, it's technically not, you know, you don't get born. Yeah. That's not, it's to not a town team. Right. It's not a it's town different. team. So, how has that process been for you and kind of navigating that from Medfield, which is not like that? 
yeah, I, I don't know what's in the water at Medfield, but 40 kids show up and they're all good. So that was easy. A um, little bit more involved, obviously, on this side of things. Uh, we really have you know the normal, like the open house nights, stuff like that. You know, so you got to add those to your calendar. And it's a great way to meet the kids and kind of once they visit, you can kind of get into it a little bit. Um, we don't we don't reach out proactively. That's that'd be against uh, the MIA rules, and we absolutely play by the rules. It's easy enough to do it. There's still plenty of athletes out there, and Severance is an awesome school. So we're you know we waitlist in every grade again, I think, which has been the case since COVID. Um, so it's almost the problem is there's too many kids sometimes where someone might come late and be a good player, and you're like, oh, man, we got like 50 kids on the waitlist in front of you. Like I'd love to, but doesn't work that way right you know it's a it's a school first as it should be um and the overall goal of course is to send them to college so right. you know it does take a certain type of kid they're not going to you know bend the rules because a kid can run a 4-4 right you know those days you kind of wish they would but overall they do it right and our admissions guys are great uh so very lucky very spoiled they make it kind of straightforward for us at least now you started accepting seventh and eighth graders was it two years ago uh, I think it's a little more, maybe is set, five, six. That many years yeah. ago now, huh? So you you offer lacrosse for the seventh and eighth graders as well. Yep, we have two teams. We've run it like a town team, no cut. You know, we want to let them play for as long as they can. Sure. Or and some of those kids are just picking it up. Yeah, because you don't know what you have in the uh, seventh no grade. Idea. You know, they could be really good or they could be really bad, but they could be really good in high school and not turn out as good as you thought they might, right? No, so you, you got to give them all a stick and see where, right. where it goes. Some of the best guys I've coached either picked up the game in eighth grade or changed yeah. positions. You know, yeah. Robert Treber was a goalie for me back at Medfield, went to Tufts. Yeah. He was an attackman until eighth grade, switched to goalie. You know, ended up being an All-American, ended up at Tufts, worked out pretty good for him. Yeah. But, you know, if we were cutting kids, right? you know, that, that kid's probably getting cut. Right, right. Um, so running it like the town mall is the best way to do it. I, That's, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the interesting things about Massachusetts uh, across the board, especially in division one is uh, eighth graders can play yeah. high school games, which like I'm, I'm from New Hampshire. I'd be like, wait a minute, <laughs> we can get eighth graders. Really? Like, I don't think we're allowed to do that, but if we were, I would literally like, I coach at a school that is also the middle school. <laughs> I would literally be in the halls with like flyer signups like this after every break. Like, please, please come play lacrosse. Are you in eighth grade, seventh grade, next year? You know, like I, I feel like that helps. Kids on the way by. You're five eleven. You might be able to hang. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Well, if they're taller than me. They can play. It's fine. Yeah, I think it's it's. And, you know, for us, I think it would take a really special kid, um, and not just athletically, socially. You can't drop a fourteen year old necessarily into a locker room with. Yeah. You know, in the Catholic Conference, some of them are 19 by the time they're graduating. Right. You know, repeating is so common now. So really, you'd almost worry more about that than the skill. I mean, they'll be there a year later. You still get four years out of them. It would really take a spec. It would have to be a total waste of that kid's time. Or he'd have to be so dominant physically where you couldn't put him on the field with eighth graders to move him up. That's kind of how we look at it. All right, class. It's the NCAA Division I Women's Lacrosse Championship. Welcome to Phantom 101. Want to give your team the ultimate assist on the lax field? Here's your assignment. Lesson one, get loud for every goal. Two, work in groups. And three, attendance is encouraged, but passion is mandatory. The Division I Women's Lacrosse Championship, May 26th and 28th at Wake Med Soccer Park in Cary, North Carolina. Buy your tickets today at NCAA.com slash WLacrosse. Class dismissed. Dedication, skills, focus, and the drive to play at the highest level. Laxachusetts is committed to providing the coaching and curriculum that will allow boys and girls to learn and grow as individuals and as teammates. With an emphasis on skill development and academic excellence, their players have led the country in college recruiting for the past 10 years. With over 800-plus players moving on to play in college and over 130-plus high school All-Americans, Laxachusetts has been able to set the nationwide standard unmatched in the sport of lacrosse. To learn more, log on to laxachusetts.com. That's laxachusetts.com. Yeah, I mean, I, I just go back to like Bill Ricca. Bill Ricca had a kid in, in eighth grade who was, he's just slinging. He scored, he scored a goal in the, in the championship game in yeah. D2. And I was just like, what? So I'm one, looking at the list. Out. like Tiny well, little guy, too. I was at the game. I, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's not always physical, but it, it probably would be in, you, in your case. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think kind of separates uh, Division I uh, in Massachusetts is, is the actual, like, full athleticism. And I think one of, the, one of the guys that you've added to your roster for the coming season 
uh, that is the personification of that is Henry Hasselbeck. Yeah, that was that was that was a good pickup for us. You know, athletically, he, he flies. He was the fastest kid on the football team, I think. Uh, there was one play where he ended up dumping a ball off short to the running back. Um, this kid might go who can fly, and then somehow caught him and ended up in front of him and threw a block like forty yards downfield. Like, oh, that's yeah, that's Maryland speed. That's the Division One speed right there. Yeah. So that's it's nice to have because you know BCI and Prep certainly have it all over the field. You got to have it too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to help your transition. Uh, I watched him play for 3D New England, I think. <sighs> God, it had to be last summer. Uh, I think it was at, at the Babson tournament, the tournament at Babson. And he, I was like, who's that? And someone was like, oh, it's Hasselbeck. <laughs> and I was like, uh, that Hasselbeck? And he, they're like, yeah. And then the next play, the ball was on the ground. And I looked down at my book and I looked up and he had carried the ball in like two seconds from the restraining line to the other restraining line. And he was still running. And I was like, what, what, what happened? Like, it seems like he's one of those guys. He has a lane. He's hitting the lane. He's bringing the ball up. And you can see like when you have that kind of end to end speed, why, you know, tell him recruit him. Solve some problems. That's for sure. Clearing the ball. I mean, it makes you look smart. You can just give it to that kid. Why don't you just run it out for me? Especially at the college level, the shot clock, right? You only get 20 seconds yeah. to get it over midfield. So you get a guy that can, uh, you know, motor. It's certainly going to yeah. help. You yeah. know, and if you get the ball over in 10 seconds, you get 70 seconds to shoot on the on the, on the the and the goal. You know, so the quicker you get it over, it's an advantage for the offense. That's a good point. How, how do you think thank you're Thank you. Gonna, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, how, how do you think you're going to use him this year? Uh, well, we're going to shovel as much. Andrew's plays he can handle. The great thing about him is he's worked on every other part of his game. He's not just a fat, like a fast kid sure. with, who holds a stick like a hammer and can't do anything else with it. Um, I've seen him shooting on the field. He can he can put the ball where he wants to, and obviously 3D is, does such a phenomenal job coaching those guys up where he knows what he's looking at. He knows where the ball should go. So it's our job to kind of find some ways to put that speed in places where he can use it other than just clearing the ball. Cause, sure. I mean, I certainly don't want him to just run down the field, dump it, and run off. He's not... He's not that guy. Right. So well, I'm he, sure he'll create a, a number of double teams once he gets a step on his guy, or maybe triple teams, and open up the other side of the field. Uh, you know, I mean, that, I mean, see, you know, that uh, always looking for a little more, create a little more space and time for the other players on the field. Yeah. I think those those Catholic League defenses, it's funny. Like, they, they don't go out that far to play guys because they know that if they go out too far, they're going to get burned by half the guys that are on the field. Like, the athleticism in that league is so especially at those positions where you're attacking with the offensive players is so elite in terms of the top, like three, four programs that like, if you have a bad match, that's a goal. Like I've seen it happen multiple times. I mean, if you watch any of the state title games, especially the last two years, BC high and St. John's prep, it's, it's not a one-on-one -on -one duel so much as it's, we want to get this guy against this guy. How do we make that happen? How do we yep. move the ball this way? How do we, you know, how do we get the matchup we like? Is that something that you've experienced? Yeah, I mean, especially both those defenses are so well coached that you need to find that way to have a sudden change and win quick and make hopefully two people react when it should be one. Because if you're going slow and just kind of nibbling around the outside, they're not going to – I mean, even back when Steve Lydon was coaching BC High and they had, you know, Will Bowen and Tommy Joyce, they wouldn't chase out unless they wanted to, unless they had a guy like, oh, we're going to take the ball off this kid all day. But for the most part, it was – all right, we're going to make you come to us, and then we're going to take it from you, and it's going to hurt, and you're not going right. to want to do it again. Right. Um, right. And, you know, they still play the same way. Prep, you know, runs a college defense. There's, they have multiple slides set up depending on where you dodge. You know, you can hear them communicating, so it's it's not easy, and they're not going to chase you for no reason because, like you said, the speed's there for certain guys, and then you're in trouble for no for why. What's your – What's your experience been kind of developing Zaverian into a team that can compete with those two teams, especially in the last couple of years? Is it a lot of stuff that you do in practice or is it a lot of matchup play and uh, style of play for you? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of an interesting question. And, you know, Zaverian always did, you know, the, you know, the, the cupboard wasn't bare. Tim Gardner ran an awesome program. And the only thing that made it kind of a restart was the COVID year where we had a gigantic senior class leave and ended up with, I think, three guys with varsity experience by the time we were back, which is the only reason we felt like, oh, my God, we're rebuilding here. What happened? Um, a bunch of your guys, unfortunately, didn't get to coach. You know, the Alexanders, um, 
It's the biggest regret of my coaching career, I think, right, yeah. missing that year with those guys. I mean, they were outstanding. But not only outstanding players, but just great young men. Great young yeah. men, you know. And leadership wise, that was yeah. you lose all that. Now yeah. you have seniors who've never been the guy. Right. So that was tough. But um, in terms yeah, that's of a, that's hard to interrupt. But that's got to be. I mean, we talk about how you know COVID has affected so many different players, but that senior class. And to your point, not not having the opportunity to coach those players and losing a class like that is is massive to a program. Yeah, and, and we heard it or felt it leadership wise, especially because now you got a a sophomore who's now a senior who right. was like a third line guy. Right. Now he's got to be the guy and a captain. He has no experience doing that, so that was the hardest right. part. Um, and, and he had no, and he had no, had no one to learn from. Exactly, you know, because yeah, you know, we were locked down, and then we had the kind of weird fall where guys couldn't really play um so we're actually just coming out of that we feel like finally where this junior class a lot of them played as freshmen so they kind of know what it takes to compete with a st john's prep or bci you've been punched in the mouth enough times right. where you know kind of how you have to come correct and how you need to practice and so yeah which is where we try and do most of it is in practice right and um, it's the way you play more than the matchups right so in that in that vein like what is your preferred style of how do you want to coach offense and how do you want to coach defense? Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've played a lot of zone against BC the past couple of years because they were so athletic at the midfield, especially my first season. We prefer to be man-to-man and kind of like those two teams play. You're going to have to come to us until we get you in an area and we're sliding to take the ball away rather than sliding to panic and help right. somebody. Um, that's It's easy to say and draw up. It's not always easy to execute. You know, you got you know Ayers coming around the pipe with the ball on his stick. That's kind of a tough double team to stick every time. Um, and then we just want to play fast offensively. You know, it's it's we grade our guys on decisions rather than the result, rather than uh, the results. Sorry, I forgot how to speak. Um, so if we run by a guy and we make the right two passes and someone drops it, you're not going to hear about it on the sideline. You know, you'll hear go do that again, play fast, fight. Um, and we're lucky that we have a good face-off guy and we're strong in nets, so we can kind of get away with that where you don't have to take the air out of the ball. Right. How, how did you think teams <coughs> perceive you coming into the season now? You, you have a ton of uh, junior commits. It's actually what the cover story is that I'm working on. Um, uh, you have six rising junior commits uh, for D1 in this class. Uh, do you think that's like a lot of extra pressure? Um, well, if it is, they better embrace it because we're not giving any of those commitments back, that's for sure. And, you know, we have some good guys in the senior class. Our goalie's a third-year starter. You know, Will, Will, Will Pasnelli's going to BU as a midfielder. Right. Dylan Benoit's going to Assumption, you know, Division II. Um, there's a, a saying that now I now have learned to hate, which is, you know, when you're okay at something, you tell people how good you are. When you're, when you're actually good at something, people tell you. People have been telling me we have a wagon for, like, three months now, I hate that phrase now. I absolutely hate it because we haven't picked up a single ground ball. We haven't had one practice. Who knows what it's going to look like? Right. We, we might stink. Yeah. I mean, I hope not, but it's got to come together. These guys have to gel. That's just pen to paper right now, um, especially in our league. And I know Prep and BCR aren't, aren't too concerned. They're one and two, as they always are. Yeah. We're still chasing. But commits are an individual thing. They're not a team thing. You can't even, you know, have any success if the players are thinking about I'm a committed division one player. I mean, you know, I've been in situations where we're playing against teams that have 20 division one commits and, and we'll beat them because we're a better team. It's about being a team, right? Coming together as a team, you have the talent on paper, but like you said, coach, you may stink. Hopefully yeah. you don't. I mean, you get everything on paper, but they got to compete together as a team and be good teammates. And you know what, what's the goal here to win the state championship, right? Put your egos aside. Put your commitments aside. Those don't mean anything. I mean, and they don't mean anything when you get to school either. And they're partially projection. I mean, we don't put them on scouting reports for a reason. Like, oh, this kid's committed to UNC. Well, he's not there yet. He's not on the team. Right. So he's still a high school kid. You know, let's not overthink it here. I think it's it's different for the kids, though, because, yep. I mean, we... And we, the parents. And the parents. But, like, for the kids, uh, you know, uh, last year we played a... Uh, uh, at Hogwarts, we played a, you know... Uh, an, Opening season jamboree. None of the games counted. Just kind of tune up. And we're playing against a Division One team in New Hampshire. And they have – the kids know who's committed on the roster. I'm like, how do you know that? 
they don't know each other now. They don't, it's crazy. They, it's, well, it's, I mean, it's New Hampshire and it's small. because. But you, the reason I say how do you know that is that this isn't a team that's plugged into the internet, man. The, <laughs> like, I'm coaching in the sticks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm impressed that they, like, know what Instagram is at certain points. where, wow. And they're like, they're, they're like, uh, coach, that guy was committed, committed. I'm like, I don't. Stop talking. We're on the sideline. I'm like, stop talking about that. In the middle of the game here. Middle of the game. And we, you know, we lost six to two to the team. We, was, we only played like one half. And the kids were like, oh, we did, we did pretty good. Those are the committed team. I'm like, you lost. We lost by four. Stop. Like, stop talking about that. You know what I mean? I'm like, are you guys all committed? And they're like, no, coach. And I'm like, then yeah, we did good, but like, we can't just like be in awe of people we play against. And I think like, you know, Obviously, my team's a kind of an exception to that rule because, like, a lot of people aren't in awe of things. But individually, being like, oh, playing against this kid, he's committed to Princeton or something, that still, like, holds weight no matter what level you're at. At the high school level, do you well, do you get that at all? Like, do you be a big you, confidence builder for guys if you own that matchup and a hundred percent? This kid's going see, there. See, you just went, you went, you went glass half full. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't normally do that. Uh, the, geez, my players be shocked to hear that because yeah. normally I'm the guy like, what, you want his autograph? Shut up. Like, I, yeah, I don't care where he's going. hundred percent. But I've seen it with guys, you know, who've who've played even a, a great first quarter against someone who's you know kind of a headliner, and all you say to him in between quarters is like, dude, you're crushed. I'm keeping up. And you can see them kind of, sure. you know, the shoulders come up a little yeah. bit. They get a little, I mean, they're still high school kids. They need the confidence. That's why they play the games, right? Yeah. You know, you show up at a game and, oh, they get 20 commits. Ah, uh, we probably shouldn't play this game. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, uh, I, think, I think let's go uh, back on the let's pause. Go home. Let's go home. Yeah. Right? And it's not where you play. It's not where you're going to play. It's how you play. Yeah. That day. Every day. Particular. Every and day. day. Yeah. Every day. Every single day in practice, mm -hmm. in games, when you go to college, there's 45 guys just as good as you. You got to find a way to get on the field. Yeah, and there's 20 and, more coming and, the next and, year, too. And, and you've got the same situation as a variant. You know, the one thing that, you know, I've been around this area for a long time, but the Catholic schools, I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, no one talked about BCI, Zavarian, St. John's, CM. Now they've all got great programs. More and more kids are playing. More and more parents want better education for their kids. So, you know, let's see, the Catholic school, ISL, and obviously, you know, the public school teams have gotten better too because there's just more players playing. So it's becoming more challenging for the better players to get maybe the time that they think they're supposed to have because they think they're better. And they're paying for it. It's their customer. So there's, go. there's that whole it's extra, a great, yep, you're absolutely extra right. angle. That's, I mean, a, that's a great point. How, how do you feel about that as i mean you're basically working for kind of not to put it this way but you're you're working for two places that you know you need to pay to basically play at or, yep. or be involved with but you came from a place where you know the culture is so strong in midfield that like it's like they grow lacrosse players there you know yep. it, did that what was your adjustment like from that because I, I i keep coming back to that because i know it's like such a point of Emphasis. I flipped the switch in my brain. I think the day I took the job, where I was like, "Okay, we got to think this other other direction now." Right. Um, one of the reasons I, I love Laxchusetts is, you know, Dan Chenard and you know Dave Evans and Sean Morris have kept it as cost effective as they can. And I know there's guys that have been scholarship and helped, and those guys all have day jobs. You know, some of the guys we work with from around the country are like, "You guys are nuts. Why don't you just add three more teams and you can, you know, looking at Dan, you don't you don't have to be a firefighter anymore." And he's like, no, I'd, I'd rather, you know, keep the price point where people can afford to do this because, you know, not every kid is a trust fund kid. Right. You know, thank God. Right. You know, I love the, the gritty town guys. It's my favorite no, ones. No question. Right. Um, and then, you know, yeah, you know, it's a variant. It's just, uh, thankfully, we're not charging like 80. So it's it's still right. a somewhat reasonable number. It's not like eight grand like when I went to CM, unfortunately. But um, we kind of don't think about it in a lot of ways. Right. And, you know, once they're in the building, those are the guys you got. So, right. not I just, a great answer, but. No, I mean, I kind of get what you're saying, but it's, it's, do you. If you're asking. Do you, you feel know, differently about it is, is actually what I'm getting at. I'm, I'm kind of clawing at that. Like, do you feel differently about it? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and, you know, it, it's such a weird setup. And we're not the only state, but where you're playing with towns and against towns. And it has, like you said, to your point, it hasn't been a big issue until recently because who was winning all the championships? Towns. Right. Um, so if this bubble we're in now continues, 
mean, who knows? And we're not the only sport where, you know, that's a discussion. You know, you saw some of the hockey scores yesterday. You know, it was an 11 nothing win. We won 9-1. to one. You know, maybe that's getting rid of the Super 8, but it's also two towns playing two, you know, private schools. I mean, it's like that where I'm from. I mean, you know, B- BG, you know, listen, BG beats everybody. Derry Field gets the championship game. Uh, you know, they're, they're building at St. Thomas. You know, th- I mean, luckily in Division Three, there isn't any – Buddy, that's that good at that level. What what's happening is, back in the day, your best lacrosse players played within those great programs, right. Hingham, Sudbury, Cocker, Kyle, and they continue to. Right, you probably don't lose as many kids, and now Franklin and Medfield probably don't lose that many kids from those programs. Right. Now the other programs that pop up, let's say a King Philip or Reading, well they're a great program now too. Not a good example. The better players from the weak public high schools are going to the Catholic schools because they can they can afford it, and maybe there's some of them are going to the ISL schools. So the weaker public high schools are getting weaker because all their better players are going to Catholic schools or private schools or prep schools, and you know in New England. Right. And I agree with you. I think they're going to have to do something because it's not fair. I don't think it's fair for the kids to go to the private schools to play against the public schools or the public schools to play against the private schools. And some kind of a playoff, I don't know what the answer is. But um, I'm with you. I don't know what the answer is. Someone smarter than me has got to figure it out. I mean, right. And, you know, we'll, like I said, we'll see if this bubble continues. Because if it goes right back where it's, all right, Lincoln Sutter is clearly the best team. They've won, you know, what was it, four out of six or – but I don't see it going that way. I don't. I don't at all. I mean, why not? Uh, because the, the game continues to grow. I mean, you've got kids starting at, in kindergarten now, learn to plays, and you know, uh, the, seeing the, all the success of New England players going off to Tufts and Assumption and St. Lawrence and getting a great education, and it's opening lacrosse is opening doors for so many players. It's it's the ticket to get into a good school. It's an opportunity. Sure. It's an opportunity for players to go to school that they normally wouldn't be able to get into if it wasn't for lacrosse. Yeah. And you can't say that about hockey or or basketball, maybe football. But you look at all the Division One lacrosse players for Massachusetts, all the Division One football players, basketball sure. and hockey. The numbers have to be graded with lacrosse players today. So this even at great schools, NESCAC. I mean, most New England kids are going to NESCAC schools. A number of them are going to Ivy League schools, and they're going to the BUs, and now they're going to the Merrimacks. They're all getting great educations, to, you know, and now lacrosse, all these different programs popping up. That, that's the answer. Yeah, but it, that kid who just is learning to play and is good doesn't, doesn't automatically mean their parents have enough money to send them to all these things. No, it doesn't, right? but Catholic school, Catholic school is a lot less than – Prep schools. Prep schools are sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Right. That's crazy money. I mean, that's more than some colleges. So, I think the value is great value at the Catholic schools, in terms of tuition, education, athletics. There's a lot to say for it too. You know. Yeah, and absolutely. Kids like I needed all boys with structure. I mean, I was an eighth grader in Needham as a lunatic, wild man. They didn't even know what to do with me. Yeah, show up to see him the first week. You're still a wild man. (laughs) Show up to see him the first week. Get cuffed on the back of the head by one of the brothers. Like, oh, I I, I better button my top button here. These guys, these guys aren't messing around. Yeah. Um, So there's something we said for that too, which is you know the other side of it. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I hear that a lot. Where like we really want this for our son. He needs some more structure. Absolutely. Fewer distractions. Like, well, yeah. The preps do do that too. I mean, if I didn't go, if I didn't PG, I would have not made it through college. If I, I, I didn't know what structure was. Cause I, we, you know, I'm a, I'm from a small town. We didn't have, we didn't need it. And then when we got it, it was like, oh, I have to like do my homework and not talk my way out of it. This is hard. I don't want to do that. Actually but if study? I didn't do that, actually study, actually show up to class, <laughs> not like just throw in your paper, you know, like that. And that's different. Well, when my sons went to St. Sebastian's, I was a little, not really concerned, but I was going to, you know, how they would interact to an all boys school. They loved an all boys <laughs> school. They loved it for, for a number because everybody at that school is driven to do well in, in academics, athletics, um, and you don't have any distractions. No distractions. Right. In the classroom, no distractions anywhere else. So, you know, you, you're there, you're on campus, you focus on your academics and your athletics, and then you go home. 
And if th there are distractions at home, fine, but they're only at school. Would you agree with that? There's fewer. Or it's a different type of distraction. Right, right. It's a little bit easier to snap. Yeah. Snap them back in. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. besides, they all have phones. It's, it's easier than it used to be, you know. Everyone's got an alarm clock in their pocket. Yeah. So they, you should... they told us we wouldn't. They lied to us. That's you, true. You don't walk around with a calculator all day. Well, yeah, I do. Actually, I yeah, do. I think you'll find I do. In just a few short weeks, the 2023 Boys High School Lacrosse season will be getting underway. Why not get a jump start on your season and attend the Interstate Preseason Training Day on Sunday, March 19th at Wheaton College? This event is open to all high school age players that are interested in tuning up the lacrosse skills before tryouts begin. The coaching staff for this event will feature local college and high school coaches that will work with players to improve their skills and get their game ready for the season. For more information and registration, go to PiatelliLacrosse.com. Looking to keep up with all the latest news and information on New England lacrosse? New England Lacrosse Journal and LaxJournal.com are the premier resources for information and inspiration on the New England lacrosse scene. Have every issue of New England Lacrosse Journal, the magazine, delivered to your home or office. And don't forget to stay in the game every day with a digital subscription to LaxJournal.com to receive daily digital lacrosse coverage on club lacrosse, college commits, prep and high school, division one, two, and three colleges, showcases, rankings, and much more. Get in the game and behind the scenes now by logging on to LaxJournal.com. Just click on the subscribe button and start the subscription that is right for you today. New England Lacrosse Journal is a Siemens Media publication. Siemens Media. Inspiring, informative, insightful. What is your expectation for this season? Um, those are always tough because I hate – you can't write championship on a whiteboard. It's too nebulous of an idea to be a, like a realistic goal. Sure. Um, so we really just focus on the small building blocks. Are we better this Monday than we were last Monday? And I don't know better at what. Maybe it's we fixed the clear this week. Okay. You know, something tangible we can all grab onto because it's a long season, as you know. Um, and if all, all that's up there is the kind of the end result, it never comes together as well as it should. Um, so it's tough. It's almost like being a teacher with your kind of like scope and sequence where you have to look at like – Every individual week is a unit, but also where is it heading? Um, learned that while at Medfield as well, where you actually have to plan and put all these things in and sometimes pull yourself back. Where you're like, I can't install six offenses. Like, that's not going to work. Yeah. Let's, let's install two and be really good at them. Um, so, yeah, our expectation is, you know, just to, just to improve, just to get better. Um, I think we're all thinking would like to, you know, take it, you know, a round further. You know, went down to Higgum phenomenal team in the team. round of eight and yeah. fell short you know there was no no shame in that loss we lost to a better team so i think we'd like to go further than that but it's a long way to go to make it happen what are some of the things that you are going to adjust and do you think maybe do a better job of this year than last year uh beginning of last year we couldn't clear the ball worth a damn um so we fixed it which was nice um how'd you fix it uh, we just changed it up and totally ripped off, you know, what Dover Sherburn's always done, which is just spread everybody out and we have an athletic goalie and, you know, find an easy two-on-one. And it, it's just easier decisions. We were too crowded. We were making things happen too quickly. And it's high school. So even if we made the right look, it's a kid at a dead sprint over the shoulder. We dropped a lot of them. Can't do that against St. John's Prep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, clear away from the box. Yeah, clear away from, I don't know, all those machines they have hunting in the middle of the field. I don't know how you <laughs> yeah. do it, but yeah. BC high struggled with that in the champ game actually a little bit. That was one of the things, not, not a total separator, but some of the things. And I remember they messed up a ride and I just saw pitch and lose it, <laughs> it was, which he doesn't do that often. Doesn't happen. It often. doesn't happen often, but they, they messed up a ride in a timeout and he was just heated. And, uh, I feel I, like you earned it when you lose it. You're like, yeah, yeah, I, I love you know, that. I love that with coaches, though. I, I, I love that you said you needed to work on your ride because I think that's such a huge element, part of the game that sometimes gets overlooked by a number of coaches. And even I think some players might take it lightly, but clearing the ball is one of the most difficult things to do under pressure situations, big games, games yeah. tied, you know. But, um, you know, I think. I think it's easier to ride than it is to clear. Do you really? I do, because you do have to think, but you really have to 
be able to see the whole field when you're riding, and you've, you, you've got to be able to handle the ball, move the ball um, upfield. And right. I, there's more pressure. There's not a lot of pressure. If the team, if the team clears the ball on you, there's, there's not as much pressure as to clear the ball. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, if the other team clears the ball, as long as it's not a fast break situation, you know, okay, they cleared the ball. I think of it a little differently where I feel like clearing is mechanical. If you, if you have, I mean, just an L clear is like mechanical and riding for the way that I, I approach riding the way I coach riding is very, it's very important. If you don't lock in our lock ride, we are going to give up a run and that's bad. A run at our defense. We're going to give that up. We, we, we talk in terms of like limiting the top space. We limit that. We lock you off. We don't 10 man, but we usually jump the goalie. God, I can't, I should not be talking about this on the podcast, what we do, but we jump uh, just like, I mean, you don't have to worry about it, but we jump like right at the restraining line, but not in the way that most people do where we jump from the, from the back. So that defenseman doesn't always come up even. And yep, in, that's what we say though, is that's why I say it's mechanical because our defensemen, if they don't do it in practice or any of the drills, we're, we're we don't yell that much. But that's one of the things where we're just like, no, you have to be here, and this is why, and we will do the scenario. But if you leave the farthest pass as the only open pass, that's how. That's the be- that's easy if you're riding. If you're clearing, it's not. It's I think it's getting the getting the two on ones is is good. But the best way to get the two on one is to break the first pass, right? This is how you look at it: offense, okay. defense, football, right? Yep. If you're an offensive player, you have an advantage because, you know, you go out for a pass, you know where you're going. The defender doesn't know where he's going. When you're riding, you know where you're going most mm-hmm. of the time. When you're clearing, you don't know where those guys are coming from. Okay. Okay, so you you, you got to read and react when you're clearing the ball. You don't necessarily have to – you do have to read and react, but not – you know where you're going. You know what I mean? You, you The offense is – clearing the ball is the rider's – and the it's the opposite way for the uh, for the guys clearing the ball. We, right. We work on it every day. This is how we talk on a clear. These are the things you say. Don't say anything else. You know, mm-hmm. don't wave your stick and say here. This isn't little kid ball. Yeah. And we work on the overpass every day because yep. that's it's one of our benchmark hundred percent on the uncontested over. If you I don't can, ever want to drop one. I don't ever want to see one go. Oh, I lost it in the sun. I mean, college excuse. college players miss that pass all the time. The cross field pass oh. from the backside on that defenseman. You ne- you always pressure the worst defenseman or leave the worst defenseman. You know he can't catch. If it. you ca- if he can't catch, catch like it. let him go. And we all know the riding game and clearing game has changed so much in college lacrosse, and it makes uh, the game so much more exciting. I, I love watching the riding clearing at the at the college level now. It's just it's so much. It's fun. what separates real nerds of the game but, from, yeah, and like coaches because, from yeah. like parents. You just don't know what's going to happen. Like here's the six on six. Oh, he did so good. Here's the set there, and I was like. What ride were they running? It was the only good thing about that like Big Ten camera angle where you're that viewing is from true. the moon because that's the only time you could actually see the back three or four guys. And it's like if you're watching Yale yeah. or Virginia ride, it's like, yeah, I get the pressure part. What are you doing back there so they don't just dump it to an open guy? Yeah. That's the part I need. Right. Yeah, I exactly. can't see that part. Yeah. Can you show me but what that watching is? Watching it live, it's fantastic. I tell you, I love the, you know, the, the, the shot clock for college lacrosse. Speaking of the shot clock, ISL is, is uh, adapted to uh, <laughs> the shot clock. And I personally, and I'm, I get your opinion on it, but I think it's a much better game. Do you think the MIA will ever go to a shot clock? You're yeah. going to have to at some point, right? I flipped on it. Now, now I really want it. Um, and I think they'd like to do it. It's it's a cost measure where, you know, we'd pay for it, and you'd pay for the clock operator. But they all do it for basketball anyway, which is the part schools don't want to talk about. Um, that's a good point. But yeah. is, is your team that's 14th out of 14th in the league going to be super happy out of that athletic budget? on an 18 game schedule to pay a kid to do this. Yeah. Your argument is the same argument I used that I didn't think they would do the shot clock and the cross for a long time. And why I think they didn't do it because it is added expense yep. and it's a, you know, even at the college level is a third tier sport. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. It is. We work in it. We know none of us are rich. Okay. <laughs> like it's, it's not the, you know, uh, like you use basketball as an example. That's a great thing. If you have that, a person that knows how to do that. Yep. 
But also, do they know when to reset it if it hits a pipe or yeah. uh, if a goalie tips it, if it's not going in, like all that kind of stuff. Or if it hits, this is the thing that's happening lately is the side pipe and they're giving resets. I've watched it three times in college already. Really hitting the outside of it. Hitting the that. outside and hearing it. And then the ref does this. It's got to be robotic for the official. You hear the pipe and he just does it. I mean, it's not. I mean, you're not supposed to. But. Not, it's not terrible, but it's not good either. <laughs> it's because they're not on goal line extended. <laughs> They should be on goal line extended, right where the, the shot is uh, hit the, the side pipe. But they're not, they're not on the ball. If you're talking about college guys being out of place, so don't even don't even worry about the high school guys. <laughs> yeah, no, we're. Uh, I'm still. Don't mad. tell Dow Benson. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Get myself in trouble again. Yeah, yeah you don't want to do that. Well, let's 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 talk about about your uh, your personality. Oh boy. Because I I think it's. <laughs> No, 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 I like it. I, I was telling Jack, I was like, he's kind of a wild man on Twitter. It's, it's pretty great. But like how, I mean, I feel like you've calmed down a little bit. Oh, yeah. So how, how did that kind of progress? Like, did you just see like no one was really being real with people? Because like you're definitely, <laughs> real is one thing that I would say that you are. I just don't care. From that angle, <laughs> I'm just like. It's the, best, it's the best answer I've ever heard. So, like, look, it's, we're not doing this to get rich. No. I mean, you, you, coaching high school, you get paid, you get your gas money back, hopefully. Um, and what's the worst thing that happens? Oh, all right. It's it, This isn't what's paying the bills. So I guess the, the downside isn't that huge. Right. And thankfully, eight years under John Isaac fixed a lot. Of, there's, if we're talking about swinging wild, you're one and two. There's plenty of things that would get tweeted and my phone would ding a minute later like, dude, don't be an idiot. Yeah. So he, thanks, John. You fixed a lot of that. Appreciate you, brother. Um, so, well, well, we all have to grow up at some point, yeah, a little right? bit, right? And we we grow up a little bit every year, and you know, it makes us better. And you know, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of young got young coaches. They come out of the gate and they're excited, and they want to, you know, they want to do this, and they want to do that. I remember when I took over the high school program in Brookline. I had you know three rides and three clears and five man ups and four plays. And it's like at the end of the year, I had one clear, one ride. You know, and um, you know, if we had, if we had Twitter then, I would have been getting killed. You know, yeah. you know, Piatelli's got these three players and three rides. He's not, and now I'd be, I'd be yelling back at him. You know, that's the, you know, be like, yeah. I don't care, I don't get paid for this. Well, it's, and I also always go back to you know the late Bruce Lurch, which is there's always a way to talk about a play to talk about the kid that made the positive play, yeah. not the one who got beat. Yeah. So that's kind of a big red line yes. where you won't see that going out there, where it's that's, like, wow, I scout in this game, this goalie stinks. Right. Like, wow, this no, this team shot really well. Wish that I learned that a and, long time ago. And you, you know what? <laughs> you, you'll appreciate that more when you become a father. Yeah. Because I always look at that stuff and I say, if that if that was my son, I wouldn't want anyone to say that about him. Even if even I can say that to my son when he comes home and say, hey, you were terrible. That goal you let in, oh my yeah. god, that was horrible. But for other people to say it, especially in high school, no reason though. if you're getting paid millions of dollars to do something and you make a mistake, sure. Throw yeah. it at him. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been barked at more more than fairly before. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you you don't bet a thousand. And sometimes you go, oh, yeah, you're right. Right. That was a misstep. I apologize. Um, you're a better man for it. Yeah. Sometimes you, have to, sometimes you have to say sorry. I'm still waiting for Jack to say it to me someday. <laughs> um, but, hey, that is actually all the time we have. That actually flew by. I feel like we could have sat here for another two hours, maybe like cracked a brewski or something, just talked about it. Not that any of us do that, but keep the podcast going. Please it was a lot of fun. Coach, yeah. nice, nice meeting you. Pleasure. Yeah, no, nice yeah, to finally, yeah, yeah, finally meet you in person. Absolutely. Yes, and thanks for having me. Um, of course. Great job. I think I'll still have my job after this. Goes I out, hope so. so that's a yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're fine. If anyone's in trouble, it's me with yeah. uh, with Coach Ice. Uh, thanks again for listening to New England Cross Journals, Chase the Gold Podcast. For Jack Piatelli, I'm Kyle Devitt. See you next time.